You can start whenever you're ready, Taylor. So, hello and welcome to all. Thank you guys so much for coming. Um, uh, thank you so much for joining us for our inaugural gathering of Research Bytes. Uh, my name is Taylor Pate and I'm the Multimedia and Marketing Assistant for the Center for the Study of Race, Politics, and Culture. The monthly Research Bytes series is one of many programs that we've initiated to celebrate the Center's 25 years of engaging scholars, students, staff, and community members in interdisciplinary scholarship and programming around the topics of race and ethnicity. Thank you to Tierra, our Center's program administ administrator, for thinking up and bringing to life this series. And thank you to Anaga Dalal, Director of Communications, and Ndidi Opar, Multimedia Marketing Assistant, for their work behind the scenes. Our goal for the series is to connect staff from across the university with faculty affiliates of the center who study, teach, and write about race and ethnicity. We wanted to create an informal and interactive space where staff can learn firsthand about some of the exciting research happening on campus and to provide an opportunity for faculty and staff to network with hope that we will find some shared interests and possibilities for future collaborations. You can subscribe to our Research Bytes and CSRPC listservs to be notified of future conversations. The first 25 staff members to register for Research Bytes events will receive a $20 Grubhub credit to buy lunch on us. Congratulations to those who are enjoying their lunches right now. We apologize for any confusion, but want to emphasize that these perks are reserved for staff only, but welcome the students. We welcome the students in the Zoom room. Um, today, we are joined by a very special guest, Alison Nadia Field. Uh, Alison Nadia Field scholarship contributes to, involve, to evolving areas of study that investigate the functioning of race and representation in interdisciplinary contexts around cinema, surrounding cinema. Her primary research interest is in African-American film, both silent era cinema and more contemporary uh, filmmaking practices, and is unified by two broad theoretical inquiries, how film and visual media shape perceptions of race and ethnicity, and how these media have been and can be mobilized to perpetuate or challenge social inequities. Her work is grounded in sustained archival research, integrating that material with concerns of film form, media theory, and broader cultural questions of representation. Please give a warm welcome to our friend, faculty member, Allison Nadia Field. Um, thank you so much, um, Taylor, and thank you, Tiara, Anaga, um, and of course, Gina, Marilyn, Tracy, um, as always, it's it's just always great to be with you. And I'm really excited to do this research bites. Um, since I came to the university in 2016, um, CSRPC has been a fantastic um, partner, uh, collaborator. It's been a home away from my home department of cinema and media studies, um, and as CSRPC has really uh, supported a lot of my research um, with grants and uh, collaboration. And I was also I've been on the executive committee for a while, and I was really honored to be part of the committee that helped to search for the new faculty director, um, an inspired choice, if I do say so. And Gina's uh, research bites also inspired me to think about my own origin story as a scholar. I think it's always a useful exercise uh, to think from time to time about how we got to where we are and what inspires us in our professional journeys, you know, what matters to us and why. Um, so I really appreciate this opportunity to kind of step back and, and think about that. Um, so I'm going to share my screen. There's also going to be, uh, Anika is going to put links to some of the stuff I'm talking about in projects in the chat. So keep your eye on the chat for the links. Um, so my origin story, <laughs> such as it is, um, I come from a mixed background. My mother is Egyptian. Uh, she's a Muslim from Cairo. And this is my grandmother and me. And my dad is a white Anglo-Saxon New Yorker. And my dad's family came to America before the American Revolution. So they fought in the revolution. And my mom's an immigrant <laughs> and a naturalized citizen. Um, so they came from very different backgrounds. And they met in grad school in California. You can see here when they were young. And I was born 
in Boston. And I, I love this photo of my mom. Um, she's pregnant with me and she's this stunning brown woman in this weird environment with my dad's like waspy ancestors on the wall behind him and a very 70s wallpaper. I was a bicentennial baby, which you can see on the, the t-shirt she has. Um, so I grew up in a Boston neighborhood called Chestnut Hill, um, which is where Boston College is. Uh, and I was actually really lucky to go to very progressive schools um, that emphasized what they called in the 80s and 90s multicultural education. Uh, and they were also invested in arts education um, with a social justice bent. Um, and I was really fortunate to have practicing artists as teachers throughout my schooling. Um, this is my art teacher, Fern Cunningham Terry, um, who's a well-known Boston sculptor. And um, a mural that my class painted in eighth or ninth grade, I think, where we mixed in self-portraits with portraits of civil rights figures and social justice advocates. So that's my self-portrait, me, <laughs> along with my painting of Nelson and Winnie Mandela. And you can see Winnie's visiting Nelson in jail. <laughs> this is around 1990. Um, and so you can also see why I did not become an artist. Um, but the mural was framed with MLK Jr.'s quote, anybody can be great because anybody can serve. All you need is a heart full of grace and a soul generated by love. And that mural with the, the quote around it um, hung in the cafeteria of my school the whole, you know, um, for years, decades. Um, and I think it was very, this is the kind of formative uh, experience and art experience that I had as a kid. Um, but even in that environment, you know, I didn't feel like I fit in anywhere. Um, certainly not in the waspy world of Chestnut Hill or even among other Muslims or Arab Americans. And I think that sensibility led me to be attuned at a really young age about how we perceive differences, how they get enacted in and through media and how we adopt perspectives and internalize ideas about race, ethnicity, class, and gender, and so forth. Um, and that really led to my academic interests. You know, I'd always been invested in the way visual culture informs beliefs and actions um, and can be marshaled to fight injustice. Um, so that uh, ultimately led me to grad school. And when I was in grad school, um, two things happened, I think, uh, in particular, that led me down my research path. Um, the first is that in my very first year, I went to a screening of Haile Garima's Sankofa at the Harvard Film Archive, and it that screening totally changed my life. Um, if you haven't seen the film, you should. Uh, so here was a film that did all of the things that I was invested in in film studies. It directly engaged history. It was about social justice. It was about problems of representation, about questions of film form and aesthetics. And it didn't adhere to fiction film con narrative conventions at all. Um, and I was like, I wanna write about that. <laughs> I wanna do that. Um, and eventually I did, um, I did write about it. Um, and the second thing that happened when I was in grad school is I took a seminar a really uh, formative seminar on African-American literature with Henry Louis Gates Jr. Um, and I got interested in, in turn of the century political theory and mass culture's role in it. Um, and so one day I was roaming the stacks of the library um, back when people actually spent time in the library. Uh, and I was reading the Booker T. Washington papers in these bound volumes on the stacks. And I came across a reference in one of them to the Hampton pictures and the birth of a nation. Now, I didn't know what that meant beyond a reference to the school that Washington had gone to um, or why they were making motion pictures or what that had to do with birth of a nation. I got really, really curious about what was going on. And it turns out that Hampton Institute uh, was making films as part of their publicity and fundraising campaigns. Um, and in 1915, they gave one of those films to exhibitors to show after screenings of Birth of a Nation as a kind of way to correct the racist history and to kind of say, well, things were bad then, but look how good it is now. And this was a super bad idea for a lot of reasons. Um, but, and you can read about it in the book. 
but this is this chance encounter in the library stacks was really a revelation for me. Um, you know, we think, or for a long time, I think historians had thought of black cinema as emerging as a response to the racist film industry, like with Birth of a Nation. Um, but it turns out that actually, though, that it was a wholly original engagement with the medium. And institutions like Hampton and Tuskegee in the South, as well as Northern filmmaking entrepreneurs in places like Chicago and New York, even Boston, were making films before 1915 and before Griffith's racist epic. Um, so that small reference in the Booker T. Washington papers ultimately led to my first book, um, Uplift Cinema. Um, and, you know, that book, uh, in addition to being kind of a history of pre-1915 Black filmmaking practices um, and understanding kind of the political role of, of film in the Uplift project, was also, is really also um, a method for how to study films that we can't see. Uh, now, films made by Black producers don't survive prior to 1920. Um, they're entirely non-extant, with very few exceptions. And so history, you know, the history of cinema is really written on a foundation of absence. Um, and this is especially acute for films made by non-white filmmakers. Um, and so that project, I think, ultimately led, led me to really appreciate the work of archivists and film archivists and the work that they do, uh, which then led to a set of collaborative projects that many of which continue to um, this day. And so um, the first was uh, concurrent with my work on non-extant early Black cinema. Um, my first academic job after grad school was at UCLA. I was like really lucky. Um, and in my first year, I partnered with the UCLA Film and Television Archive on a large scale collaborative project on the filmmakers and the films of the LA Rebellion, which was a, a loose affiliation of filmmakers who met at UCLA in the 70s and 80s. And there's a link in the chat to um, the UCLA Film and Television Archive's um, landing page on the project for the LA Rebellion with lots of cool links. Um, and this included Haile Garima, right, who I'd first encountered in grad school. And also Charles Burnett, Julie Dash, and really over 50 filmmakers and fellow travelers who had constellated around UCLA at the time. Um, that project was curated by the then director of the UCLA Film and Television Archive, Chris Horak, and Jacqueline Stewart, who was at Northwestern at the time. Um, this was when she had left Chicago, went to Northwestern before she came back. And she had been taking a year to do a certificate in moving image archive studies at UCLA when I was there. Um, so that's when we first connected around that project. Um, and that's actually Jackie and me in the front row of that picture flanking Clyde Taylor, uh, who was the one who named the group the LA Rebellion. And Julia, I saw that you're here and you can see Chuck there on the, on the far left. It's so nice that you're here. Um, we, uh, in that project, we did oral histories with over 30 filmmakers. Um, we did a traveling film series, that's the program of it in the center. We did a DVD set, you can see on the right, um, for educational release. And we also did a book, um, which you can see on the left uh, and is in the chat, um, with a comprehensive filmography, uh, excerpts from the oral histories and um, critical essays. Um, so there's of course lots to say about this project. Um, but I'll just say, and we can talk about it if folks are interested, um, but it also connected to other work in Los Angeles, particularly around student filmmaking and non-theatrical films, films that are made for purposes other than um, commercial theatrical distribution. Um, so while I was at UCLA, uh, Marsha Gordon, who's a scholar at North Carolina State University, reached out to me about a film that she was researching that to her seemed to share an aesthetic with the films of Charles Burnett and other LA Rebellion filmmakers. And this is obscure educational film from 1965 called Felicia. And it's about, it's about a teenage uh, girl living in Watts and there's a link to it. You can watch it on the internet archive. Um, the film was used as, it's a short film. Um, it was made by film students at UCLA, white film students. Um, and it was used as a classroom film for discussion about social difference, um, 16 millimeter film that they'd show in class and the teacher would then use it as a way to springboard discussion about various issues 
And it's, you know, the idea was like, if you see the life of a teenager, it's more relatable to other teenagers. So you could talk about kind of what your life is in relation to hers. Um, but the film um, offers this really fascinating glimpse into the neighborhood um, pre Watts rebellion. So in 1965, at the time of the rebellion, national attention, right, turned to frame Watts as this kind of urban jungle and its inhabitants as out of control animals, like all of this media discourse. And so this film was made just right before that. And so you get a very different glimpse of what this neighborhood was like. So we talked to the filmmakers about it. We tracked down Felicia herself, um, which was an incredible uh, experience. And she actually had never seen the film um, that the filmmakers as film students, they kind of finished it and then they never showed it to her, which is funny. And so for her, when we showed it to her in this cafe, you know, on our laptop, um, for her, it was like a home movie. You know, this was, um, she broke down in tears seeing her mom um, who had long since passed and, you know, having this this recording of something so intimate in her, her life. Um, and, you know, I think for me that really affirmed the power of film preservation and the importance of recovering these so-called, you know, minor forms of cinema. Um, and of course, non-theatrical films vastly outnumber films that were made for the movie theaters, movie theaters, right? So we're talking about church films, government films, educational films like Felicia, home movies. Um, so they are really the ones that dominate the visual landscape of the 20th century. Uh, and so uh, Marsha and I then co-edited a book about race and non-theatrical film um, and brought together archivists and scholars to talk about the range of films that shaped American perceptions of race in the 20th century. Um, and we got Jackie to write the foreword, which was really great. Um, and as you can see here, and it's also in the chat, we made sure that there was a companion website so that folks could stream the films because you could read about them, but it's so much more valuable if you can read about them and watch them, of course, for teaching too. Um, so we had a companion website and streamed as much as we could. Um, now, in the middle of that project, I moved to the University of Chicago. Um, and, you know, this is such an incredible place to do the kind of work I do um, because it really encourages and enables me to bring together scholarship, archival work, and public engagement. Um, and I'll just give a couple examples of that. The most recent um, one, uh, is the Sojourner Truth Festival of the Arts, um, which we put on last uh, winter and spring, where we mounted an homage festival to the first Black Women's Film Festival that was held in 1976 in New York City. Um, we did a nine week public screening series um, connected to a course that I taught uh, last winter. Um, and then a four day symposium in March uh, that was co-sponsored by CSRPC that brought together 70 women filmmakers, writers, artists, um, archivists, and scholars, uh, including Tracy Matthews and Emily Hooper-Lanzana. Um, and of course, uh, we recorded absolutely everything. <laughs> um, and we did interviews uh, led by Elizabeth Miles um, and the Digital Storytelling Initiative. Um, there you are, Tracy. Um, I think there's a lot to say about the symposium, um, of course, but it was a really an honor to co-curate this with uh, Monica Freeman, who's up here on the left and also down on the bottom two pictures. Uh, she was the original film curator of the film component of the 1976 program. And also working with Yvonne Welbin, who's the founder and director of uh, Sisters in Cinema, which is here in the South Side of Chicago. Um, along with Mike Phillips of Southside Projections and Haley O'Malley, who's a junior scholar at Iowa, whose research into the 1976 festival really launched the whole thing um, and got us kind of heading down this path. Um, one of the things that we emphasized when we had these filmmakers together is the importance of care and stewardship of their materials. Um, so we had a workshop on preservation for filmmakers that was led by Rachel Stolce, who's the former president of the International Federation of Film Archives and the current president of the Association of Moving Image Archivists, um, along with C.K. Ming and Ina Archer um, from the Smithsonian National Museum of African-American History and Culture, um, who just 
explain to the filmmakers, you know, what the risks are around media deterioration, media obsolescence, what to do right now with your stuff, you know, get it out from under your bed, what, to, what, you know, and now not to think of Rachel's holding up a DVD thing, I think a DVD um, box and just talking about how things that we think are secure, are actually not secure. Um, it was terrifying. <laughs> Um, but I think it was a really, it was a wake up call to a lot of filmmakers about how, what they need to think about in terms of making sure that their legacies and their works are preserved. Um, uh, and I think this is really vital advocacy work that's really needed since, um, you know, people don't often realize how precarious um, our moving picture cultural heritage is, not just nitrate film, um, but even things that are on hard drives, especially, I should say, things that are on hard drives. Um, so because of that, I joined the advisory board of Missing Movies, uh, which is a group that's committed to finding and preserving uh, films, even recent studio films um, that for a variety of reason reasons are considered lost. There's a link also to that so you can learn about the important work that group's doing. Um, but even I think with these kind of questions of advocacy and preservation and archiving um, from a scholarly perspective, I'm really invested in also sitting with the absence uh, a bit, you know, since so much of film and media history is lost, right? It's really uh, dominated by overwhelming loss. Um, and so as I did in Uplift Cinema, I think it's important to write about films, even if we can't see them. Um, otherwise, we're really alighting the, the majority of film history. So over 90% of films made before 1915 are considered lost, and over 70% of films made before 1930 are no longer extant. Um, so if we only write about the survivors, we're really, been, you know, we're, we're uh, missing a whole bunch of history, of course, um, but we know, we know how survivors are um, survive only because of certain power dynamics and and a lot of uh um a lot of ingrained kind of um systemic reasons for valuing certain kinds of work over others um so one way to approach things that we no longer have access to is through speculative approaches. Um, and last year, I guest edited two special issues of a journal, Feminist Media Histories, on speculative approaches to media histories. And mostly I wanted to know what other people were writing about. <laughs> so that's why I did it, because um, I was sure that this was an issue not just for scholars of Black film history, right? But for, for scholars of global cinema, for, for scholars of work that's um, you know, takes place in conflict zones for uh, other kind of non-white and non-dominant filmmaking. Um, and I'm currently at work on a, a book on what I call the speculative archive that centers the figure of William Foster, um, who uh, is considered the first black filmmaker. He's Chicago-based uh, filmmaker from the teens, but none of his films survive. Um, and so I'm really interested in methodologies of speculation that can help us access these histories that were occluded for a range of reasons. Um, Foster is really interesting because even though none of his films that survive um, that he uh, from when the time he was in Chicago uh, in 1929, he moved to Los Angeles and worked in the talkies. He just got his way into Pate Studios and worked as an assistant director for a bunch, a series of Buck and Bubbles vaudeville talk talkies, um, but he wasn't credited. So I'm really interested in how we can see his erased presence in the films that do survive through the lens of his non-extant films, the ones that don't survive, but his presence and his work is really well documented. Um, so I'm interested in kind of those, the way we can understand these kind of things together. Um, and these kind of questions have led then to another collaboration that's ongoing. Um, this year, I'm doing a Gray Center for Arts and Inquiry Fellowship with Christopher Harris, who's an experimental filmmaker. Um, and this is a project on speculation as a method for doing film history and as a mode of filmmaking, uh, especially when approaching the history of under-documented practices like those of Black filmmakers, women, non-white and non-Western filmmakers. Um, 
And I'll just briefly note that there are other Chicago related archi uh, archival recovery projects that I'm working on. Um, one is on this amazing figure, Luther Pollard, uh, who was president and general manager of a Chicago film studio that made comedies for general audiences, not for black audiences in the 1910s. Um, and he was a part of a very prominent Black family in Chicago, and his papers are at the Roger Park Historical Society, Rogers Park Historical Society. So I've been going through them and trying to piece together that history and figure out you know, how we got into the movies. Um, and it also, of course, entails working with film archives on the material that survives and um, even if it's fragmented. Um, and thinking about what we can learn from archival rediscoveries. Uh, and then, you know, the second project that is related in terms of archival rediscoveries is the one that's really dominated my research for the last five years. Um, and that's really the main project that I've been writing about is this rediscovery of an 1898 film of a Black couple kissing. Um, it was found in 2017 by an archivist colleague in New York, in Los Angeles and um, named Dino Everett. And he approached me to identify this film. And together we figured out it was titled Something Good Negro Kiss. Um, and it was made here in Chicago uh, in 1898 by William Selig. Um, and there's a link to it in the chat so you can see it, um, it's really beautiful. It's the first known film depicting black affection. And um, as you can see, uh, it's also a remarkably uncaricatured film uh, for, you know, a film made at the time of such rampant uh, racist misrepresentation at the turn of the century um, and in the silent era. Um, then I identified the, the, um, the actors as Gertie Brown and St. Subtle, who were vaudeville performers in Chicago and part of a quartet called the Ragtime Four. And there's a lot I could say about this project and I'm writing a book now about it and about the these performers and about the rediscovery. Um, but one of the things that's been so important to me has been the response, um, the public response to the film's rediscovery. Um, we successfully nominated the film to the National Film Registry in 2018, which is a list uh, named by the Librarian of Congress every year of 25 titles um, of kind of cultural or artistic or historical significance. Um, the registry should be coming out next week, I think, so you'll get to see what's named this year. Um, but because of that, it really catapulted it to national and international attention, and then it went viral on social media. Um, and that viral spread then inspired contemporary artists to engage with it in really exciting ways. Um, and so poets wrote about it, filmmakers reimagined it. And most recently, you can see on the right, uh, Lauren Hill apparently used it in her current concert tour. Uh, friends of mine went to the show and kept sending me pictures. Uh, so that's very exciting. Um, and so I think a lot about the importance of audiences and contemporary engagement with um, media artifacts. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of ways I think we can reactivate these historical materials and these, these archival artifacts. Um, you know, St. Subtle was a ragtime composer, uh, so, um, who published ragtime sheet music, um, which luckily, some of which survives in, in archives. Um, so I was really excited to work with MacArthur genius composer and pianist Reginald Robinson, um, who's a ragtime pianist, to do an event at the Southside Home Movie Project um, with the Southside Home Movie Project, where he played his own compositions as well as St. Subtle's. Um, this was music that hadn't been played in over 100 years, um, 120 years in some cases. Um, and APL and the Southside Home Movie Project team, Sabrina, Justin, Tony, and Avery were incredible and produced an event that activated the archive of the Southside Home Movies and put them in really generative dialogue with the archival material that I'd been working on, both the films, but also the ragtime music. Um, and so this is just an example of the way I think that um, my scholarship right now is very invested in public engagement, um, you know, thinking about writing both writing scholarship, but for a general readership, um, thinking about film exhibition and ways of bringing materials to new audiences. 
um, archiving and preservation work, um, as I said, ensuring the longevity of this material through careful and thoughtful stewardship uh, of media for future generations. Um, and also social justice, you know, the issues of representation are acute um, now. You know, if we think about cell phones and social media, you know, it's not George's, George Floyd's murder that catalyzed a movement per se, right? But it's Darnella Frazier's insistent recording of it and its circulation on social media that catalyzed this movement. Um, so for me, I see media as crucially active um, across the 19th and 20th century in, you know, from on the one hand in, in terms of racial subjugation um, and the workings of white supremacy, but importantly in resistance against forms of anti-blackness and its operations. Um, so that's that's what I do. <laughs> and I'm really excited to talk to folks about any of these projects or any other ideas. I will stop sharing. I don't think we dropped it in the chat, but people can feel free to come off mute and ask a question, or if you feel more comfortable dropping it in the chat, you can drop it there. Yeah, I can read this question. Um, from Kevin, in relation to your first book on Uplift Cinema, could you speak a bit more about the state of Black cinema today and where and how to locate films that do the similar kind of work in the present? Oh, that's such a good question. I mean, there's a lot uh, to say about the contemporary media landscape and there are people that are, are much more equipped to talk about you know, what's going on in Hollywood, for example. Um, what I will say is that I think one of the things that the one of the lessons of Uplift Cinema is the importance of looking adjacently and to think uh, about black cinema as a really capacious category. So one that is not just about what's, you know, what we can stream or what blockbusters might get greenlit, um, but also about the ways media functions in a lot of different spheres and spaces. And so I think one of the exciting things to me that I learned, I've been learning about, especially in relation to the Sojourner Truth Festival, is the incredible work of contemporary filmmakers, independent filmmakers, women, um, from the New Negress Film Society, for example, to folks working here in Chicago, um, to, uh, you know, thinking about the ways in which film can be a tool of self-expression, a tool of community organizing, um, and also just the incredible experimental work uh, that's coming out of places like the School of the Art Institute um, around. So how to locate that? Um, that's a really good question. I mean, I, I think finding the films is the hard part because, of course, we know that that uh, you, media attention tends to um, emphasize things that are corporately sponsored or, or budgeted in a certain way to buy um, advertisement. But I think following uh, particular groups that are doing this work, I really, I follow like on Twitter, Alfredo Cinema in New York, um, uh, My Cades Project, um, which is an aggregation of Black media, is really great for in terms of a web resource. Um, and I think uh, things like Blacklight Festival um, for new material, new work coming out of that. I don't know, Tracy, if you have thoughts about good places to find new stuff. Um, but I think, you know, it requires work. And that's, I think, one of the things, just like archiving, um, we don't think, we think everything's kind of readily available. My students do. I mean, when I when I tell them they have to watch something on film, they look at me like I'm crazy or I have three heads, um, that not everything is streaming, right? And so this, finding the the good stuff takes some effort. And I wish it weren't, I wish it were more readily available, but it doesn't, it's not always the case. But I bet people can throw in chats, in the chat, other sources and the ones I've mentioned of where they aggregate, um, you know, who they follow for the kind of latest. Kevin, I don't know if that answered your question.
I also, I, I mean, I think the other kind of question that is part of that is a definitional one of how we define what black cinema is. I think that goes back to the silent era where it was a really complicated thing then too, right? So there was a category of films called race films that were meant to be films that were produced for black audiences. They may not have been directed by black filmmakers though. They may have been white owned companies directed by white directors that for usually commercial reasons wanted to capitalize on the market. Um, but some of them were really were interracial collaborations. And then you can look at someone like Luther Pollard, who I mentioned, who's a black filmmaker working for a white company, making black cast films for white audiences primarily. And so do we count that as race film or not? Um, I think one thing that is, if you get one takeaway <laughs> from anything I say, is that there really is no such thing as a as black cinema, that it's such a large category. It encompasses a lot of different kinds of practices, often contradictory ones with different kinds of political investments. Um, and so that's why I also never talk about the black community. There are communities that are as multivocal and valent as people. So um, black cinema is a really tricky category for those things. Um, but of course it becomes one that's a tool of marketing um, like it was in the seventies, right? Like it was in the nineties, like it is more recently, so. Tracy. I have a question. Um, I'm interested to hear, thank you so much for this talk and I really appreciated the family photos at the beginning. <laughs> they were great. Um, and just learning more about your history um, and how you came to be a scholar. That was really um, awesome. So thanks for sharing that. Um, I'm interested to hear more about your project that you're working on with Christopher Harris um, mm. through the Gray Center. and. Um, I think you said speculative film history, which I'm like, okay, what is that? Like, can you say more about what that is and what the yeah. project is? Yeah. So one of the things when I started working on the speculative archive project, um, and this was because I wanted to talk about films that were non-extant. I wanted to talk about uh, people that we don't have any really much material trace of, but I think recuperating these histories is really important. Um, I think there's an imperative for that. And so partly it's figuring out methodologies. Now, now luckily in black studies, there this is a known problem. This There's a whole body of literature of scholars who work on this primarily around uh, questions of slavery. So I'm thinking about folks like Sadia Hartman, um, but also, um, you know, it, folks who are thinking about how do we access and tell stories when we don't have, you know, documentation of voices and how do we not privilege archival silences? How do we not reinscribe the violences of the archive? If we think about uh, Jean-Michel Rof uh, Jean um, Roftrio's, uh, uh, Michel Roftrio, sorry, um, uh, ideas in anthropology around power in the archive. Um, and one of the things that in my work became really clear is that there were a group of filmmakers who were doing this work through film. And so if you think about Cheryl Dunye and the Watermelon Woman, um, it's a wonderful film if you haven't seen it. Um, what she does is she, it's a sort of fake documentary where she goes, the, the filmmaker character named Cheryl goes in search of the history of lesbians in Hollywood, black lesbians in Hollywood that had been um, not documented and erased. And she finds a woman named, who was credited in Hollywood plantation films as the watermelon woman, um, but her name is Faye Richards and she excavates the history of Faye Richards. Um, and it's a really very moving um, uh, journey to find this ancestor of, you know, this, uh, this woman who sh she sh feels like she shares a legacy with. Um, what we find out at the end of the film, sorry, spoiler alert, is that Faye Richards is, uh, is a fiction that they've created this, uh, this archive that it's all fabulated. And, uh, but I think it does important work nonetheless. And so that's one example. Julie Dash's illusions is another about, um, showing a, a, through fiction film, showing the work of a black woman singer who's the voice of a white actress singing in, in Hollywood wartime movies, which we know happened, right? We know existed. And so she gives us that image. And so, um, so one of the things that Christopher and I are doing is thinking about both scholarly approaches and filmmaking and artistic approaches to speculation, to fabulation, to 
um, the archive and historicity. And so we're we're trying to figure out ways of, of working together with archival material, but also not being bound or limited by what's in the archive. Does that make sense? Um, Kelly asks, what surprised me most about the discovery of something good? Oh, other than the public's interest in it. Uh, I mean, the first thing is that it existed, that it was made. I mean, oh my God, like, you know, you talk to silent film scholars, scholars of early cinema, and none of us thought that something like that could exist. We knew the film existed because the title existed in catalogs, but everyone assumed I mean, anybody who cared, like the five of us, <laughs> that it was, a, you know, something super racist. It was probably with white actors in blackface, that it was a caricature. And um, I don't think when I first saw it, I didn't think that was a film that could have been made in 1898. And I, it's, it's shocking um, for that. Um, I think the other, the second thing that um, surprised me most about it is that it was marketed as a burlesque or a parody of the May Irwin kiss, which is which was a white actress um, in uh, vaudeville um, who had a kiss with John C. Rice and that in Edison filmed it in 1896. Um, you can see it, it's everywhere. And it's sort of the, uh, the um, it sort of became a joke in film history and in popular culture about how scandalous it was, but it's this like chaste kiss, right? Um, and so something good Negro Kiss was marketed as a, a burlesque on that. So like it's supposed to be funny because they're black actors. What surprised me is that when I did more research, it turns out that May Irwin was actually the white actress was actually a minstrel performer who was known for singing in the voice of threatening black men. So like that she would like impersonate black men on stage, even without blackface. And so she was this minstrel performer. And so what Something Good Negro Gis is really doing is like making fun of May Irwin. So there's all these weird, um, I think what was surprising to me is the way the film is really sophisticated in its critique and its media critique of representation, of masquerade, of racial masquerade, of attractions, all of those things. And you don't see that on the surface. And I, that's why to me, the history is so important, like to, to learn about really what's going on and to try to see it through the lens of what turn of the century audiences would have been seeing and who would they have been laughing at and why. Oh, yay. <laughs> Oh, wow. Okay. Promise and peril of social media and viral videos. Um, well, luckily, I don't have to work too much on this because my colleague, A.E. Um, Stevenson, who we just hired, is uh, does that work. <laughs> she works on um, social media and viral videos. Um, the promise is, uh, I'll say more about the promise than the peril. And I'll say a little bit why the peril that I thought was there turns into a promise. So the peril that I thought when this went viral was that, um, and you can see this on, on TikTok, I mean, on um, Twitter and everything, is that people took it as a home movie. So there were a lot of comments about like, this is like my grandmother and grandfather, they're so in love and look, that's genuine affection. And they took it as a straightforward representation of love. And so I, as a historian, wanted, my impulse was to correct that and say, no, these are actors, these are professionals, they're performers. And it's important to, you know, honor and acknowledge their labor and their work and the fact that they are, they're professional actors. Um, what I think I didn't appreciate with that impulse is the, is the real power that the film has on viewers now. And so I'm trying to also think about, well, what does it mean that it feels like a, a home movie? What does it mean that it feels like that it touches people in this way, that it feels like love, that it fills in a, a gap in visual representation that we don't have, right? That didn't, that wasn't recorded in this way. Um, so that that's the peril that I now realize is actually a promise. And, and it tells us so much about, um, as Haile Garima says, the hunger for images um, and representation rather than the reality. The promise, which has been incredible, is that because of the viral circulation, like I'm not a social media person, but because of the, the circulation, all of these more material has come out. So this is like been a godsend. And so archivists have then said, oh, I think there's something similar in our archive. Let me go check. And we've found since then 
two cakewalk films with the Ragtime Four, another film with St. Subtle and Gertie Brown doing The Kiss, but in a longer version that was found near the Arctic Circle in Norway at an archive. Um, and uh, it's unbelievable. Um, and and so because of that, all of a sudden, these this relatively obscure, these obscure performers, we have more that survives of their performance than almost anybody from that period in terms of Black performers. And so that's incredible. And so if folks just like looked, <laughs> maybe there's so much more. So I think the promise of the viral stuff is, is just that, finding more stuff and realizing it matters. Um, Tracy's asking if the videos from Sojourner Truth are going to be available online. They will be. They have, we're still waiting for the company to finish editing them. Um, that was March. Uh, but they, everything was recorded and they will be streaming online so that everybody can see them. Yeah. Any other questions? writing down these dates go see tina and adrian <laughs> oh that's a great question hugo is asking about um further iterations of the show journal truth festival we really hope so i mean the goal is that this is the beginning um and that folks will take up the mantle, do maybe a 50th anniversary in New York. Um, we're certainly thinking about scholarship. I would love uh, to work with Yvonne and Monica and Haley on like a, a book of primary documents around this. Um, we certainly want to encourage scholarship. Um, in the spring, we're going to have another gathering of scholars, not just about Sojourner Truth, but about kind of the contemporary state of Black media um, studies. Um, and that's a large piece of it, um, Black women's filmmaking. Um, and so we're going to, yeah, there's always, there's always more work to do. I have another question. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'm just, I'm still trying to wrap my head around um, speculative stuff and just thinking like I'm trying to, think as a, a lay person who's not yeah. you know exposed to Sadia Hartman or the the methodologies mm -hmm. and thinking behind the idea of speculation and fabulation and you know like wow you're just making stuff up like can you say mm -hmm. a little bit more about like yeah, yeah how did how yeah. do you talk about that with a with a non-academic audience but and yeah. also are there people like in the in the realm of documentary making mm -hmm. um how does that, what does speculation look like? Yeah, well, I can talk about what it means like with my foster work. So the example that I showed of his work in Hollywood where he wasn't credited, but we know for a variety of archival source from, from documentation that he was on the set working on these films. Um, so the example that I showed was from a, a film called High Toned with Buck and Bubbles, um, not very good. Um, too real, talky. Um, but in the film, Buck and Bubbles, uh, there's a, a fight sequence um, that, uh, and I showed a, an image of that, They they there's a boxing scene. Um, it turns out, so uh, William Foster was a boxing aficionado. He also had a sports column in the Chicago Defender and in the Indianapolis Freeman at the turn of the century and wrote a lot about boxing, about the image of boxing, about motion pictures in boxing and Jack Johnson, who was a prize fighter, right? Um, and so one of the, the kind of ways in which I think about speculation is saying, okay, well, if we know he was on set, and if we know he was involved, what are the kinds of things he could do? And how might we read that particular boxing scene through the lens of both a black director, but also a boxing aficionado? And like, what does it, how do we understand both the way it's shot, but also the mobilization of all these extras? We also know in extras in Hollywood, were paid um, per day by body. So families were encouraged to, you know, bring their entire families and get $7.50 a day for every member of your family <laughs> to sit there on the set. Um, so thinking about those environments and what it would have meant for his 
presence, the presence of his body in um, on set and what that would have meant in relation to the white directors, to the studio. Um, so that's partly what I mean by speculation is that do I know that he assistant directed that particular film? Not exactly. Do I know that he was there? Yes. What would that mean? Um, so that's one one way of, of kind of connecting it. Um, and then Allison's asking about um, in speculative history, are you finding material in ephemeral sources? Yes. Like oral histories? Yes. Um, from African cinema? Uh, yeah. I mean, it's all ephemeral sources. I mean, a lot of my my sources are, are newspapers, but a lot of it is also like mentions, um, uh, things in oral histories, things that are just like scribbles in the archive, really. Like, so a lot of it is taking the trace. Um, what Ashley Farmer says, doing more with less, um, which I think is is one one of the kind of my mantras about how can we take the very little we have and do as much as we possibly can with that. So Tracy, that's another way I think about speculation as another kind of lens to bring onto material that we can look at from other frameworks. Um, but speculation is a really powerful one for when we don't have a lot of the empirical evidence that survives. Thank you. Uh, hi, uh, Daryl here. Uh, very, very informative. Thank you for your time. Any words for you know new uh, filmmakers of color who are about to release something and to you know keep in mind and from from yourself? Yeah. Oh wow, that's a great question. Um, I would say plug in with the the festivals that are especially interested in new filmmakers, um, certainly like the Heritage Film Festival that's all online, that's run out of, um, in, in outside of DC, that Ofumalaya Makara, who's um, both a member of the LA Rebellion, but was also part of the Sojourner Truth Festival. Um, she runs that Heritage Film Festival, um, which is really beautiful. Um, the festivals here in Chicago, I would say getting in the festival circuit is probably the best bet. I mean, Tracy probably has better advice about um, that than I do, but um, getting on the radar of uh, local writers and, and critics. Um, so having your work in front of the people who are writing for New City, writing for or programming, um, I think would be the other thing that would be really valuable. Um, and then just keep going. Um, <laughs> make sure as many people as possible can see it. Yeah. Right. Good luck. This is why I'm not a filmmaker. I don't, I don't, <laughs> I don't, I don't have it. What's your film about, Daryl? Wow. Um, my film is called uh, Edible Eats. And I guess have you, you've ever had a craving for something and you wasn't really satisfied and all the changes you go through until you got it and then you feel okay and, and it, and it answers the ask the question: Is that normal? And uh, it's about in the not too distant future, a um, a black owned fast food restaurant, national fast food restaurant that sells a genetically modified designer food, is under investigation because they think it makes people eat it. And our three heroes discover a darker secret about what it's really doing, and must rise to the occasion to let people know about it. I love that. I would watch it. Yeah, I would definitely watch that. <laughs> well, great. Maybe I'll team up with AE and get some social media help to yes. get out. Yes. <laughs> I had the pleasure of meeting her um, at Jackie's um, event, stored event. And yeah. yeah, great people. Yeah, I'm so glad. Definitely. I'm so glad that our department has, you know, Jackie, who's, I know she's in Los Angeles, but she's still a professor in the department and AE. Yes. Okay. Are there any other questions? Well, since we have this moment, um, you have a, uh, the other medium that shares the same fate of, you know, people, especially back in the day, hunger to see themselves on the on the screen was the commercial industry. Mm. Uh, I got started at Braille Communications and and um, that 
agency started in the early 70s when this new consciousness of the of uh, African Americans came into being. Say it loud, I'm black and I'm proud. We wore afros. We started getting more Afrocentric, and ad agencies like that became evolve because they had to talk to the black audience in a new way. And he just bet everything with McDonald's and Coca Cola to say, all you got to do is just show black people doing everyday stuff, and it will be successful. And white folks won't run from you. Stop buying your product. And he was right. It was just, you know, when you you don't realize how affirm, affirming seeing yourself on television in a commercial, uh, eating breakfast with a you know, black family eating together, kids jumping rope together, and all kind anything. He said it was so simple because we just we're not used to seeing our image come across in a commercial. And that yeah. really you know, broke I'm so ground. glad you mentioned commercials um, because Luther Pollard, who um, I showed young and old who who worked in Chicago, he actually his whole career was in commercials. He had an advertising agency that and he worked until the mid 70s when he was 100 years old and he died. Um, but he he came up with the slogan, you know, don't spend your money where you can where you're not welcome or something like that. And it was all about you know, the power of black economics and and uh, commercial um, and commerce. And so he really understood also the kind of imbrications of commercials and motion pictures and like the importance, as you said, of like, the, you know, seeing yourself in, in advertisement, seeing yourself on screen, seeing yourself on television. Um, yeah. Thank you all so much. Thank you. Yes, thanks so much, Allison. I really enjoyed the talk. <laughs> and there's any more questions, we're gonna end it there. All right, thank you guys. Have a great day. Thank you all, thanks for coming. Thanks, Bucky. Thank you guys so much. Anna, the, the recording. <laughs> I'm going to watch something good right after this. Oh okay. yeah, click on it. It's short. It's like 20 seconds. To watch yeah. it. I'm like, this all this information was so great. Thank you so much. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. Have a great day. You too.